Good morning, congregation. Good to see you this morning. We're going to sing a few songs. Join in with us. Stand up. Get dressed. Fix your hair. Come on, let's have church. I know you're not with us, but let's do it.
that I'm on. Can you hear me? Okay, we're good now. Um, still not used to this whole technology thing. We're trying to still grab a hold of it, figure out what we're, what we're doing and, and all that stuff. Uh, I want to thank Steve and all the musicians for coming in once again this morning and leading us in worship and, and uh, letting us see that, you know what, there is some sense of normalcy among chaos in our world right now. And if there's one thing that we know is needed, it is God's peace, it's God's comfort, and God's strength. This morning I want to take, uh, ask you to take your Bibles and join me in the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke this morning is going to be where we're going to be looking at. The title of the message is simple, The People, the Passion, and the Power of the Cross. I'm talking, uh, it's, it's Easter time, it's that time of year where we really kind of just hammer out the cross, and we're going to continue this morning looking at the people, the passion, and the power. I think sometimes we forget about the passion of the cross and the power of the cross, 
But there's also the people of the cross. And this morning, we're going to just take for just a few moments this morning, and we're going to look at those things. Um, and I, I know that several of you have prayer requests that we've seen. I've seen some of those coming through. We pray that you'll continue to send those. Also, if you feel led to give this morning, there's a link via Givelify. Go on ahead and you can give now. Or if you want to drop those off by the church or bring those up here to the church, uh, one way or the other, you can make sure you will continue to have the ability to give. Uh, and the more you give, the more we're able to give to our community. So let's, let's be aware of that. Uh, let's look this morning at Scripture for just a few moments uh, of what the cross is saying. When we look at the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, we're going to begin to read in verse number 32. Now last week we looked at Simon of Cyrene, and this week we're going to continue that thought process that was there. It says, And then there were two also two other criminals led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left hand. And then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided his garments, and they cast lots, and the people stood on. But even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others, let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, come and offering sour wine, and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription also was written over him in the letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals who were hanged, blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said to Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Father, I pray this morning that your word would be exactly that, your word. That, Father, we would allow it to take uh, root in our heart and strengthen us, God. That we may serve you, we may know you, we may follow you. And, Father, we may be led by you. And, and God, in all things, we, we want to see you glorified and see you honored and and, and, and even in this time right now that our world seems to be in so much chaos, God, I just pray that we would, we would have that peace, that peace of knowing that the same God who offers salvation to any and all who believe is the same God who currently right now gives us the sweet peace that He offers to every single one of us. Father, we pray this all in Your Son Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So let's take for a moment and look at the people of the cross. First of all, we see in our Scripture that there were two people. There were two criminals. In verse 32, it's very clear as it opens up that there were two other criminals that were going to be crucified with Jesus. We note, according to Scripture, that one was going to be crucified on his right side and one was going to be crucified on his left side. Verse 32 opens us up to realize that the cross was reserved for the cruelest of offenses and was therefore used to strip any and all men of dignity. And yet, this was simply going to be one of the things that Jesus on this day would die with two common criminals, two thieves, would hang next to Jesus. Now, that's not all we see in, according to verse 32, but in verse 35, we, we notice there are some other people that are present. And in verse 35, it says, And the people stood looking on. Now, we notice that the people of Jerusalem had came out. They had heard of this King of the Kings. They had heard of this uh, Lord of Lords. They had been there uh, when Jesus had done the miracles that He had done. And they were also the very people that sang, Hosanna, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. And now these were the same men who just a few short hours ago had said, crucify Him, crucify Him, crucify Him. Yes, there were the people of Jerusalem that were there that day. But not only do we see that there was the criminals and the people of Jerusalem, we also see, according to verse 35, that there were rulers there that day as well. It says in verse 35, But even the rulers with them sneered. 
and, and they sneered. And what that means is that they sneered is they said, He had saved others, let him now therefore save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. Now that, that's something that's very interesting is that now that they had said, okay, we're going to crucify Him, but not only are we going to crucify Him, we're going to challenge Him. Okay, we've seen Him provide bread. We've seen Him heal. Uh, we've seen Him bring back the dead to life. But if He really is the Christ, then what we want Him to do is we want Him to step off the cross and come down here and save Himself because that's the only way we will know if He is truly the chosen of God. Now, you say, oh, I would never do that. Oh, you want to bet? How many of us often are, are like these leaders? We want God to do some, something in our presence that He's already done before. We want God to provide or give us a sign. God's already given signs. Time and time and time again, God has offered signs unto His people. Yes, He had even offered them judges and kings and priests. and He would offered them everything and now God had emptied Himself to offer them His only begotten Son. But not only do we see that there were the criminals, the, Jew, uh, the, the people of Jerusalem, the rulers, but we also see that there were Roman soldiers present as well. Verse 35 says this, and it says, and uh, sorry, verse 36, it says, the soldiers also mocked Him, coming and offering Him sour wine, and saying, if you are the King of the Jews, save yourself. What's amazing here is this, is everybody on the hillside that day was wanting to see God demonstrate Himself to them once again. Isn't it amazing that people, regardless of their status, regardless of whether they're, they're lost religious uh, rulers or, or, or criminals, they all want to see God do something. They want to see God move in some manifestation in some way. Today, we live in a time where, believe it or not, people want to see God move. They want to see God do things that He's never done before. They want to see God open doors. I'm talking right now in our country, what, what's going on? Today, our governors ask us that we would take and make today a state day of prayer and that we would pray that His hand would intervene in this COVID-19 case. And you know, a lot of us want to say, oh, well, that's just once again, the president asked us this week, uh, last week, and now the governor's asking us this week, well, who's it going to be next week? It doesn't matter. If people are called on to pray, then the people of God should pray. Why? Because we want to see God show His face once again. The people of the cross didn't really understand that God was going to show them His face that day. He was going to show them His face through the greatest gift of, that all of humanity would ever know. It was not the birth birth of the Savior, but the death of the Savior. But not only do we see the people of the cross, we have to also see the passion of the Savior. And the passion of the Savior is spelled with us in verse 34. Go back to verse 34 for just a few moments where it says, that, and then, uh, uh, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. When you think about these words that were prayed by Jesus on the cross of Calvary, we have to understand something. There were for four specific people. Four specific people. And the first thing is this, He prayed for the people of Jerusalem. These people in Jerusalem did not know or had not realized the magnitude of what they were doing. They didn't realize the magnitude of crucifying the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. They didn't realize it. So Jesus, as He's getting ready to die on the cross. He said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. But then as the rulers snickered, as the rulers sneered at Him, as they were saying, if you are the Christ, if you are the chosen of God, if you can come down off that cross, Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And then we see the Roman soldiers as they beckoned Jesus and offered Him the sour wine. If you are the Savior, if you are the King of the Jews, come down, save yourself. And yet the Father prayed for them, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. But then He also prayed for those criminals. Those criminals that were on the cross. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Now what's interesting in all of this is that Jesus, Jesus wanted them to understand 
that he, he wanted them to realize the forgiveness that God had to offer them. Now, I don't know about you, but the passion of the Savior was to forgive. I, I, I have a hard time forgiving people. I have a hard time forgiving people. Anybody have a hard time forgiving people? I, I think if we're, if we're truthful with, with who we are and what we are uh, as sinful people, we would realize this, is that we all have a hard time forgiving people. And yet here Jesus was, as people were criticizing Him, as people were ridiculing Him, as people were mocking Him, He was offering them forgiveness that they had never seen, never heard, never experienced before. And yet Jesus was offering it to them, not because they asked for the forgiveness, but because God offers the forgiveness. Oftentimes we forget that we want people to ask us for forgiveness instead of having it offered. I don't know about you, but too many times in my life I, 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 have, I have held on pridefully to my anger, to my hurt, to my grudges. Why? Because I'm waiting for so-and-so to come ask me for forgiveness. Who am I? Who am I to say I can't forgive when Jesus, when He was stripped before the world, when He was beaten, when He had been whipped, when He had been taken to the cross and nailed His hands and feet to the cross, even in that moment He offered forgiveness to those who hadn't even asked. But yet, not only do we see the passion of the Savior, we have to see the power of the Savior. And so let me share with you just a few more moments this morning is this, is that the power of the Savior is, is, is rendered in this, as the people looked on, as the rulers sneered, as the soldiers mocked, as the, criminals bla as the criminal blasphemed, the power of the Savior is rendered to us by doing what? By being humble and not prideful. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by being humble and not prideful. Notice what he says in, in, in our scripture down in, in verse number uh, 40 when it says that one of the criminals basically says, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. Now, when I looked at that verse of Scripture for the first time, he just echoed what the rulers had said and what the people had said and what the Roman soldiers had said. But if you'll notice something very clearly is this, is I, I'm one of those guys that when somebody pushes me over the edge, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say, here, hold my bottle of water. I'm going to show you I can do it. And, and, and that would have been pride, wouldn't it? It would have been pride for Jesus to say, you know what, I can step off this cross and I can step back on it. Yes, Jesus could have done those things, but Jesus chose. He chose to be humble rather than prideful. And too often we love our pride. We don't like our pride hurt. Me and we're specifically uh, like that. We don't like for somebody to hurt our pride. We don't like for somebody to ridicule us or make fun of us in front of others. We don't like it whenever we feel like our armor has been chinked in some degree or, or in some way. We want people to know that we're right and we're right all the time. And the truth of the matter is, is this, is if you think you're right all the time, then you've got a pride problem which equals a heart problem, which means this. God's humility does not abide inside of you. God needs humility to abide inside His people. God needs His people to be humble so that He can use them. And yet Jesus chose to stay on this cross. And as He chose to stay on the cross, we realize that the powerful Savior was not a prideful Savior. But He was humble. Matter of fact, if we would get, uh, rewind basically about 12 hours earlier, Jesus would let these words be known. Not my will, Lord, but yours be done. If it's your will, let this bitter cup pass from me. Sometimes we don't want to embrace the bitterness of life. This morning I got some coffee in this cup right here. And I'll just tell you, this is not the best cup of coffee I've ever had in my life. It's bitter. It's got a bitter taste to it. I don't like bitter coffee. I like my coffee like I like my women, hot and strong. But I also like it with lots of cream. Now, I say that just because of this. 
uh, you know, Misty, Misty's a pasty person, okay? She, she's white as white can get. And, and I like my coffee that way. I, I like my coffee strong, but I don't like it to where it's bitter. And too often, we have a bitter cup. We live with bitterness. And bitterness keeps us. I know my wife's watching right now, and I know she's probably sitting at home, and she's probably saying, uh-huh, I knew he would. Listen, be careful, or you will end up in my sermon. It's right here, okay? I, I, you've been Mirandized, every single one of you. But the truth of the matter is this. We don't like bitter. Well, there's one thing from bitter that we can get. We're either bitter or we're better. And too often, we're not better. Why? Because we want to be bitter. Notice the Savior of the world was not bitter while He was on the cross of Calvary. He was not bitter, but rather He was a better Savior. He was a passionate Savior. Notice what He does. In verse 40 it says that the one criminal, He says, if you're the Christ, save yourself and save us. But then uh, the next criminal says this. One criminal in verse 40 answers rebuking him. Which means getting on to him. And this criminal is going to say more on the cross than anyone else would say about the cross that day. He says, do you not even fear God? Now, I think about that. When I think about that question, do you not fear God? Yeah, I, I, I have to step back and say, do I fear God? Do you fear God? I fear God. And one of the hardest things is, is that sometimes we get too prideful to realize that we should fear God. Because why? We like our life the way we want it. We like our life challenging God. God, here, hold my bottle of water. Here, God, hold my cup of coffee. I'm going to show you what I can do. This, this criminal would, would not only get on to the guy, but, but he would say, do you not fear God? Because, because sometimes, even when we're in a pressured situation, do we not fear God? If I was to ask people right now, do you fear what's going on in the world? You know, some people would, would say, yeah, we fear this or that. And some people would say, yeah, I fear this uh, disease that's coming down the pike to people. And I fear this or uh, or I fear not having food on the table, or I fear not being able to provide for my family, or I fear, you know, you, you list what you fear. But none of it can matters as much as this, is do you fear God? Because see, after this life is God. Before this life was God. If your life ends, it stands before every single man, woman, boy, and girl that you will have to give an account to yourself, not before yourself, not before your friends, not before your family, not before some tribunal, but you will stand before the foot of Christ answering what you've done and how you've lived your life. So let me ask you this, do you fear God? Verse 40 also says this, Do you not see that you're under the same condemnation? This guy's over here scoffing. This guy's over here realizing. You know, there's a spectrum of death. And sometimes we don't see the spectrum of death. And what I mean by the spectrum of death is sometimes some people are very angry while sometimes people are rejoicing and excited about going home. I'm talking, I, I don't know about you, I, I, I love the, the Scripture that says to be absent from the body is to be in the presence of God, but I don't know about you, I want to live life too. I want to see my kids grow up. I want to see them get married one day. I want to see them have children of their own one day. I want to be here. I want to be a part of that. But when my time comes, I want to be ready to go home knowing and realizing that to be absent from this body is to be in the presence of the Lord you know, neither one of these criminals came to the cross that day having that, that, that assurance, did they? One was over here blaspheming while one was over here realizing. 
in recognizing that He was there justly. I did it. I justly. He goes on in verse 41 and says, we receive the due reward of our deeds. We receive. Does anybody in here like getting what you deserve? Be careful. Because a lot of times we say, I want what I deserve. I I want what I should get. No, no you don't. Verse 41 would also say, this man has done nothing wrong. Verse 42 gives us a question of this criminal. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Think about that. Lord, remember me. Now, notice something. He's already repented. We receive justly what we deserve. Lord, remember me. If you want to know what living out Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 is, simply, it's this. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Because verse 43 gives us the very assurance of what God has to say when He says this, And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, Today, you will be with me in paradise. The assurance of faith was given that day. Yes, when we look at the cross, When we look at the cross, we see the people. We see the people, not only the people of the cross, the power of the Savior, but we also see the passion of the Savior. And the Savior is still offering us that passion, but He's also still demonstrating that power. How? He's still saving people. He is still offering salvation to any and all who believe. And for those of us that know Christ as our personal Savior, we can come boldly and say, it is well, it is well with my soul. But today, if you're, you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, you honestly can't say, it is well with your soul. Why? Because all too often, many times, we forget who God is, because we think we're God. We forget the power of God. Why? Because we're too prideful to admit that we can't control it. That we can't control this world. Listen, you cannot save yourself. It's a gift of God. Today, today, if you were being crucified, or if today, if your life was in, would you be the one screaming, if you're the Savior, prove yourself? Or would you be the one today saying, Father, remember me when you come into your kingdom? If you can't say it as well with your soul today, let me just share one more thing with you. God's not done with you. Because God stands ready to save you. He stands ready if you'll admit that you're a sinner. If you'll believe that Christ died for you and if you will call out to Him in repentance, turning yourself to Him and realizing it was my sin and your sin that held Jesus on that cross. And he couldn't step away in pride because he had to die for all of us. Where are you at today? Where are you at? Here in just a moment, we're going to sing a a, a song, a simple song. It is well, it is well with my soul. 
And so as we just take a few moments, and as we bow our heads, and as we seek the face of God, if you can't say it as well with your soul, please send me a message. Let me know. If you can say it as well with my soul, please, please let me know that as well. Because it's our prayer, it's our desire that all of our friends, neighbors, even our enemies would know our Savior. My friend, you don't have to walk away not knowing the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Romans 3.23 says this, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. Every single one of us are sinned. Sinful. Daily and daily we sin. Romans 6.23 says this, For the wages of your sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the same way that the criminal on the cross Receive salvation is the same way you can receive salvation today. Father, be with us. Help us today. And Father, if there's one here today that doesn't know you, that has never confessed you before, that Father, today they'll receive you as their personal Lord and Savior. And they'll be able to sing with us the song, It is well, it is well with my soul. It's in your name. Amen. Let's sing together. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll,
say clearly and with a resound voice, it is well with our soul. Father, I pray and I ask God that you would be with each and every one of us as we go through this time, this uncertain time, that Father, even though this time may be uncertain, we can have certainty of knowing our precious Savior. Father, I pray and I ask God that you would keep us safe and that, Father, we would remember those that are in need. God, help us to be your children and to do the work in which you've called us to do. It's in your Son's name we will pray. And everybody said, Amen. We hope and pray that you'll join us again next week, uh, as next week we hope will be the last week we have to do this uh, Facebook Live video. Uh, But if not, we're going to continue to praise the Lord. We're going to continue to move forward. Uh, There are a few announcements. Church family, please check our church Facebook family page as there will be more things coming to you so you can know about what's going to be happening and how you can help and how you can encourage those people. I encourage each and every person, check on somebody you love, check on somebody you know, check on your neighbors and let them know you're thinking about them, praying for them, and are willing and able to go and do whatever is needed to be done for them. Thank you, and God bless. We'll see you later. Thank you, guys.